Hello and welcome to Bios Ventures. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Andrew Hadeen, General Partner, and Morgan Cheatham, Vice President at Bessemer Venture Partners to the show. Both, thank you once again for joining us. Thanks for having us. Great to be to, here. To kick things off, we'd love it if you could share maybe brief personal introductions with us. Andrew, would you like to start? Sure. So my name is Andrew Hadeen. I'm a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, where I co-lead the healthcare practice and focus on investing broadly across the health, healthcare ecosystem, including biotech and health tech. Um, I've been in healthcare for about 15 years with a similar focus and you know, love what I do. Oh, absolutely love to hear it. Morgan, what about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a vice president on the healthcare and life sciences team here at Bessemer. I have been here for six years, which is almost the entirety of my career. Uh, prior to Bessemer, I was a data scientist at a provider-facing software company, and I'm also in medical school right now. Amazing. And I look forward to diving into how you juggle all of that. Uh, but before we dive deeper, maybe you can provide a brief introduction to Bessemer for us. We'd love to understand more about maybe the core philosophy as a firm and just get a general sense of context for the conversation uh, over to either of you. Uh, sure. And Morgan, definitely jump in if I miss anything. But... Uh, Bessemer is a large global multi-strategy venture capital firm with experience dating back to 1911, actually, uh, out of the Carnegie Steel fortune. Um, and things have evolved quite a bit over the last century, as you can imagine. Uh, but we've recently announced our, our latest fund, which is just shy of $4 billion. And we invest across all stages, all sectors, and all geographies. We're located across seven offices globally, three stateside and, and four abroad. Um, a lot of the healthcare and biotech activity takes place out of our Cambridge Mass office, which is where I spend most of my time. Um, and Morgan and I spend all of our time in, in healthcare and biotech, but we have colleagues who focus on consumer and SaaS and cybersecurity and deep tech and really anywhere there's entrepreneurship and, and innovation. But there's four of us on the team, two of us here that solely focus on, on healthcare and biotech. Um, as a firm, we tend to be roadmap driven, uh, which means that we create an investment thesis around an area where we think there's a ton of potential for uh, growth and uh, to build really important businesses. And then we dive deeply into those roadmaps and try to figure out where, where we can support those companies and invest behind the best companies. Um, like I said, we invest in cross seed through growth equity and check sizes can be as small as $100,000 all the way upwards of over $100 million and everything in between. Oh, that's an incredible breath. And with that intro, let's kick things off and talk a little bit more about your journeys to venture and even before, what got you into bio? So Andrew, you began your career at the University of Pennsylvania, completing an undergraduate degree in the biological basis of behavior, and then an MBA yeah. honors at Wharton in healthcare management and finance. Go Wharton HCM. Uh, from there, you worked at Leering Partners as a biopharma advisor, and then at F Prime, investing in early stage biotech and digital health companies. So maybe we should take this back to the beginning and just ask, what led you to bio? Oh man, how far do you want to go back? <laughs> uh, as far as you think uh, makes sense. I won't ask you, <laughs> but if you want all to right. get a little bit of personal context, I'm sure we'll all. Yeah, agree. sure. So uh, I grew up in upstate New York, outside of Rochester, New York. Um, so go Bills. Um, and I was the son of a physical therapist and a Lutheran minister, actually. And my parents always encouraged me to have a positive impact in the world. And as a type A student in upstate New York, I thought my only two options were to be either a lawyer or to be a doctor. Um, being a lawyer sounded terrible to me. And so that was not a path I wanted to pursue at all. And so I studied, uh, went to Penn, studied BBB, which is basically a neuroscience uh, major, which is a very common pre-med major. So I thought I was going to be a doctor um, initially. Um, but over time, I, I got fascinated by the business side of um, healthcare and how that can have an impact at scale um, in, a, in a slightly different way than uh, a provider can. Um, and, you know, just was really intrigued by that opportunity. And so as I was debating what I wanted to do, I uh, thought healthcare consulting or life sciences consulting would be a really interesting way to uh, try out business and ended up finding it really fascinating and interesting. It was during the financial crisis. And so uh, during that period of time, I held on for dear life to, to keep a job and uh, do, do whatever I could to, to help the company. And so that ended up teaching me a whole lot about the, the industry. I got a lot of responsibility I probably shouldn't have deserved at uh, the age of 22 and 23, and then um, continued on from there. And there was, there was one project in particular, I remember, where we were looking at much earlier stage 
uh, preclinical and phase one assets in that um, that project got me excited about some of the more scientific innovation that was happening in the biotech industry. And so that that got me intrigued to go into earlier stage venture, which is how I ended up transitioning to F prime uh, a little over a decade ago. And then uh, you know, was there for a number of years, went to business schools, as you said, and uh, then joined Bessemer about eight years ago. And among potential venture firms, uh, you joined Bessemer in 2015. So what prompted you to select Bessemer? Yeah, there, there were a lot of different reasons. Um, one, and I think the primary reason was the people here. Um, we got to work with my colleague, Steve Kraus, and you know, now Morgan and Sophie on our team. And those, uh, those colleagues are really important to you know, have great relationships with. And so that was a, that was a really key component to, to joining Bessemer. Um, I also liked that there were people who didn't do healthcare. And those people were also great and super smart and talented. And I got to learn from them and how they thought about investing in the sectors where they have expertise. And one of the things that was attractive about being at a generalist firm to me was there was going to be cross pollination of industry focus to both push me as an investor as well as leverage expertise for our portfolio companies where there might be an intersection between a biotech company and a computational company or um, a healthcare company and a SaaS company. It was, it was really um, compelling to be able to be part of a, a broader team with a broader platform that was able to help companies across um, multiple different industries and. And, and share those uh, those areas of expertise. And then beyond that, you know, the fact that we have a platform team here that can help support our companies beyond what the investors can do from recruiting and sharing best practices and PR and marketing was, was really attractive to be able to support our companies in that way. I can imagine. And thank you for that great overview. Morgan, I want to bring it over to you. And as you shared earlier, you began a career uh, in neuroeconomics while at Brown, did some work as a data scientist in healthcare IT at a startup, and then you worked in Goldman's IB division. Can you share more uh, about your motivations at this early stage of your career? I'd love to understand how these experiences led you to venture. Yeah, happy to. And I'd say it was a very uh, unintentional trip into venture. So um, just to echo, you know, Andrew's story, I, I grew up... Uh, with uh, two parents who worked for the government, actually. So I knew of all things, I wouldn't be doing that. Um, and, and growing up in Washington, DC, you know, I didn't have a lot of exposure to tech or finance. So I liked science and I thought that meant that I had to become a doctor. Um, very long story short, I saw my first Epic implementation. So for folks listening, Epic is an electronic medical record uh, that's at most hospitals today. And uh, that was the first time I, I kind of saw like the immense opportunity to fuse computer science with clinical data and kind of saw how software could scale clinical expertise in interesting ways. So that led me down this rabbit hole of, of working in informatics. Um, and so during undergrad, worked uh, at a company called Kairos, where we were building algorithms to match patients to their providers. And that kind of became my North Star. Like, how are we going to leverage computation with all of the data that is being produced in healthcare and, and later as we see life sciences? Um, so I, I always tell people that what actually ended up happening is that I kind of saw too much before going to med school and ultimately had to press the brakes and, and decided that I would um, follow these passions and was grateful to, to meet some of the folks at Bessemer and they, they let me hang out right after undergrad. What was supposed to be a two-year deferral became four. Um, and then as I think maybe we'll get into, I was doing some reflecting on the kinds of investments I wanted to be making and the kinds of things I wanted to be spending my time on. And I realized that going back and getting that training would be helpful foundational knowledge and perspective to contribute to uh, this versioning ecosystem. So it's a very unintentional, but uh, exciting trip into this, this strange world. And how are you finding med school so far? I know you're still going through the process, but do you find it's complementing your venture work? I think so. I mean, my colleagues would probably answer, answer better because they've seen me pre and post. Uh, I might be, you know, less well rested. Um, you know, fundamentally, um, I think that I had a lot of questions as it related to, you know, the underlying pathophysiology of, of disease and, and, and it really those origins. And I'll be honest in, in answering that. I don't think that a medical degree in isolation can, can truly answer all of those things. Like in medical school, you get a really great broad overview of, of pathophysiology across a number of organ systems. It's really helpful in biotech diligence if we're looking at something and we've seen this pathway before or we understand this mechanism of action. Or maybe you've seen that a patient with this presentation before and can appreciate what the limitations of a certain delivery model might be for their condition. Um, but, you know, I think the, the other side of this question is, you know, scientific inquiry and, you know, what, what is training in, you know, a PhD offer that could complement it. Um, I think that, you know, one of the most, most interesting skill sets that I think people can bring to the table, and you don't need formal training to have this, is can you go from some sort of a scientific question or some sort of an inquiry, some sort of a hypothesis, and take that all the way down to a result or a conclusion 
um, that's evidence based that that's backed by data. We 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 actually do this in venture all the time with the road mapping that Andrew was describing. But I, I think that's the skill set I'm optimizing for. Whether that's developed at a venture capital firm through a degree through lived experience, I think is maybe maybe less salient. And I think that's a perfect pivot back to your work as a firm. Best of Brewer has been one of the pioneers of venture and has been part of over 130 IPOs in the last 50 years. So narrowing to focus on Bessemer's healthcare and life science practice today, as you mentioned, Andrew, the team invests from seed to growth stage companies, uh, reimagining the intersection of technology and healthcare. And so, as also mentioned, you're roadmap driven. And so can you tell us more about how you think about and consider areas of investment and develop your roadmaps in your investment theses? Sure. And uh, Morgan, definitely feel free to chime in here because I think roadmaps come from a lot of different places. Um, but broadly speaking, the healthcare practice, as a firm, we've been investing in healthcare since 1986. And since that time, we, we have what we would describe as a barbell strategy, where half of the attention is focused on health tech and services, and half of the attention is roughly focused on biotech therapeutics. And you know, over time, and especially over the last five or 10 years, we've been really interested at the intersection of, of those two disciplines, especially where computation can have an impact on on therapeutics and, um, you know, broadly improving the, the healthcare system. And so, you know, that that is, you know, broadly speaking, where we spend our time. But obviously, those are really big categories. We've got to figure out where do we spend our time? Where do we build expertise internally? Um, where do we feel like we have an opportunity to invest in, in world-class businesses over time? And you know, one of the things that we're doing beyond just talking to entrepreneurs and talking to, to experts in the field is just trying to understand what has fundamentally changed about some attribute of the world in this moment in time. It might be a new therapeutic modality that's been validated. It might be a new scientific discovery that um, is, you know, giving us understanding of how to potentially treat a disease. It might be something around regulation that has impacted where we might be spending our time. And if there's a fundamental change in the world, we try to understand where we are in that life cycle. Are we at the beginning? Are we at the tail end of it? Um, why is now the right time to be investing in this space? And what's the profile of the companies that that might be interesting? And then we talk to a ton of experts and try to figure out you know, what is going to be the attribute of a really high-performing company within that space. Um, we also evaluate the space over time. And so the roadmaps can evolve. We might learn something in that work that tells us you know, even though you thought this might be interesting, you really should be focused over here. Um, and so as we're doing that work, we'll develop a framework around, um, you know, various attributes of a company that we're looking for, uh, both proactively and also reactively um, around, you know, the team skill set, around the, the product attributes, around the clinical trial strategy, if that's relevant, around the data that we'd be looking for, around the specific approach or modality that we'd be We'd be compelled by and what does the funding need to get that company to in order to have you know an, an impact on the course of the financing that we participate in and then we'll create uh metrics that we say are good better or best across each of those various attributes in that roadmap and then we go and try to talk to every entrepreneur we can and talk to um, folks who are leading these industries and um, find companies that we think find companies and teams, frankly, that we think are going to be able to build in spaces that we are aligned on that have the potential to grow into really meaningful businesses over time. Uh, I love that so much of the process involves bringing in experts, entrepreneurs, and really getting that buy-in to develop a comprehensive perspective and then build from there. And just as you said, Andrew, historically, the philosophy of investment, it feels like, has been relatively different in, from tech than traditional biotech. But in recent years, we've seen that convergence of the two models starting to meld and the development of platforms uh, that in and of themselves are powerful assets, but also the ability to advance uh, more traditional programs. Morgan would love to get your thoughts on this trend and understand how you're thinking about the impact uh, that bio, tech bio, comp bio, whatever term you'd like to use is having in uh, healthcare today. Would love to, and and we'll leave the semantic arguments to the experts on 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 branding. But um, you know, I think if you look at uh, you know, the roadmap strategy that Andrew laid out, we actually started thinking about these trends about five years ago. And we'll give a shout out to our our colleagues Steve Krause and Adam Fisher, who you know we collectively sat down and said, hey, there's a series of trends that are converging right now that are quite interesting. You've got material reductions in the cost of sequencing data that we all appreciate, and obviously the increasing digitization of clinical data. So really from the molecular level to the 
clinical level, you just have a massive influx of information that's now accessible to machine learning techniques. At the same time, you have you know increases in compute and better affordability in compute and the development of more powerful models that are using, you know, historically we've used small models in machine learning. Now we have large models and, and, and what are the capabilities that are unlocked by that? So we saw these trends coming together in 2018 and actually set forth a strategy, which again, we probably should have called some branding experts here. We called it our deep health seed fund, but we said, you know, in any new category, we'd, we'd be delighted to invest, you know, early and often as we get to know founders and, and, and experts in the ecosystem. We made a number of investments out of that uh, vehicle, you know, both thinking about computational drug discovery efforts, as well as what are the clinical applications. Some of our earliest investments in generative AI actually came out of this effort. So we invested in a company called Subtle Medical that was using uh, generative modeling for image denoising in radiology workflows. That company had just went out of Stanford um, and has really interesting applications, both in the clinic as well as in clinical trials, as you think about accelerating any trials that have an imaging-based endpoint. And then we also invested in a company called Abridge, which is using generative modeling to transcribe physician-patient, physician-physician conversations um, and to generate downstream kind of workflow uh, items from that single conversation, that single corpus of text. Um, Andrew can speak to some of the other investments that we've also made in this thesis, but I think, you know, we have a dedicated, frankly, cross-collaborative fund international strategy in this category and, and really have for the last five years. The question that we're constantly trying to answer for ourselves, to, to Andrew's point, is is why now, and, and what new methodologies are particularly suited uh, for near-term scientific or commercial success? No, I think that's a great point to dive maybe into a little bit more deeply, especially as we link it back uh, to what you were saying, not necessarily about branding before, but about how do you given your investments cover such a wide breadth of topics, how do you both differentiate the fund and develop domain expertise? How do you find the entrepreneurs to work with and also make sure that they're aware of you in the space, especially uh, in areas that are as broad as life science and healthcare? Andrew, do you want to try that one? Sure. And uh, again, Morgan, chime in here. Um, yeah, so I think at the fun level, if that's that? The questions are always for both of you, if that's not clear. Yeah, no, so, so uh, you know, I think in general, um, as a fund, we're, we're both generalists and we're also experts. And so everyone at the fund is effectively a generalist in that we as a firm look at every single sector and we opine on, on every sector. And that's important to us. It's important to push our thinking. It's important to learn from other industries and how can we apply that to the biotech industry, for example, or the tech bio industry. But on each of the teams, given the fact that we are so roadmap driven, um, we tend to build expertise in those specific areas. And so we're spending a ton of time with um, academics and uh, entrepreneurs in these spaces and former portfolio companies and current portfolio companies to help build our expertise and build our network in this space. And that allows us to have you know, the generalist point of view with the sector specific knowledge that I think can be really helpful to the companies that, that we end up working with and uh, support. You know, there's you know, also an ability for us as a firm to invest across all stages. And I think that can be attractive in the sense that we can get involved at the earliest stages of business with a hundred thousand dollar check and then grow with a company over time as they, you know, go through their series A, series B and C and beyond and ultimately IPO. And I think that that trajectory and that ability to have long-term stable capital can be really helpful. Um, you know, we also like the fact that we're able to um, have that expertise, but then leverage the expertise from um, our folks who might not look at biotech uh, specifically, but if we're looking at a computational physics-based company like Peptone, which we recently invested in, um, we can take advantage of the fact and share expertise of our colleagues like David Cowan and Tess Hatch, who focus on uh, quantum computing and uh, deep technology more broadly and share those best practices back with, with our companies and you know, leverage that area of expertise. And so we love that cross-pollination. I think that is really helpful to inform our thinking, but then also to support our companies over time. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, I mean, I, I think what you're hearing is that there's a lot of flexibility in this broader roadmap approach. And the cross-pollination Andrew describes is really where the magic happens. I think we also, in this process, come up with a few kind of almost, uh, you know, tenets or, or kind of governing principles for the kinds of companies we're going to be looking at. And I think in, in computational biology, like that's broadly been focusing on companies that are actually exploring novel biology. So it's not just a, a process of, of expedition, but it's, it's actually exploring novel biochemical space. And so 
Andrew and I, Sophia, Steve, when we look at companies in these categories, we're, we're prioritizing that. Um, you know, I think we're really excited about companies that are are drugging historically hard to drug targets. Um, and, and we think that there's unique opportunities to do that, leveraging computational approaches. Um, and so I, I think with some of these governing principles, it allows us to be flexible. We may not, you know, have personally, you know, spent 10 years researching a particular mutation or, or a particular pathway, but if the governing principle aligns with the thesis of the science that's being proposed, we can quickly run it down because we know it's going to be a good fit and that there's mutual alignment between us and the, the founding team. So I just add that as, as one thing that we really focus yeah, on. That's great. Oh, that's phenomenal. And to take it in a slightly different direction, but also focus on ways maybe in which Bessemer sets itself apart. One that's always stood out to me are the public antitheses with the heading honoring, uh, honoring the audacious. Can you touch briefly on Bessemer's anti-portfolio and maybe ask if um, there's a life science or healthcare company that might make the list? Yeah, um, so the anti-portfolio is honoring those that we've missed. And you know, fortunately we've been around for a long time and that's given us an opportunity to screw up a lot and make really terrible decisions to not invest in great companies. And so if you go on our uh, website, bbp.com and look for the anti-portfolio, you'll see a number of companies that we looked at, turned down, and they ultimately turned out to be massive successes. And you know, I think it's it's helpful for us to to remind ourselves that we're, we're not perfect by any means. Um, we make really terrible decisions at times. We also get lucky and make uh, really great decisions are able to be part of really great stories as well. But, you know, learning from those mistakes is, is really important and ingrained in the culture at Best First so that we can continually improve and, you know, make sure that we're, we're making the best decisions that we can. You know, on the healthcare side, there's, there's a lot of companies I wish we were part of that we um, either didn't see or, um, you know, turned down very stupidly. Uh, but I'll, I'll mention two that's more on a personal level where before I went to business school, um, I one had an opportunity to um, be a part-time intern um, in the BD team of Sage Therapeutics. Um, and I turned that down stupidly. And then separately, um, someone had reached out to me about a company they were calling AAV Therapeutics. And we were launching a gene therapy company when I was at Fidelity at the time. And I thought it was a little too close for comfort, and that company ended up being Spark Therapeutics. And so I turned that down also, didn't explore it. And so those those are two uh, career anti-portfolios for me. No, thank you for sharing. I know it's, I don't mean to put you on the spot, so I apologize. But by the same token, it's a, I really do appreciate Bessemer's almost self-reminder that it's okay to be humble, it's okay to make mistakes. And by the same token, those are going to improve your process. And uh, it's also good to honor the audacious who are still succeeding. Uh, now to take this in a slightly different direction, but build on the conversation thus far, would love to learn a little bit more about your diligence process when assessing startups. How do you really separate the signal from the noise when you're evaluating companies and how maybe does the Bessemer process differ? As you mentioned, you've been around for decades at this point. So I suspect uh, over time you've learned a thing or two. I'm happy to take a stab. Um, diligence is much more of an art than it is a science. So Andrew also wanted to chime in here. Um, so I think the roadmap sets the strategy for what kinds of companies we get excited to chat with. Although we will be opportunistic and speak with companies that really expand you know, our perspectives and, and help us consider new areas. And we're usually pretty upfront with founders if that's the case. Like, hey, we don't have a dedicated thesis in your category, but we think there's some sort of paradigm shift happening here, or you know, we think there's some sort of interesting technological innovation and, and worth us having a conversation. Um, the thing that always comes first is the team, right? At the early stage, ideas are cheap, people pivot, and ultimately we're embarking on a 10-year relationship with a company. So we want to be hive mind with the team and make sure we're aligned um, and, and that we have conviction in, in, in them. And so we spend a lot of time up front really assessing that, um, science aside. You know, then I think in, in, in biotech or comp bio, um, really it, it comes down to, you know, what is the technology that you've built? If it's, you know, a particular method, um, are you kind of anchoring the success of the company to the method or are you are you building something that's sufficiently flexible where you know you can integrate new tools as they emerge as we've seen in machine learning over the last couple of years i'd say the last five years really the pace of innovation is remarkable and hitching your wagon to any one kind of alpha generating model or algorithm is probably a losing strategy um we get really excited about the founders that are saying yeah, we acknowledge that this nature method of the year last year, you know, spatial bio or single cell seek or whatever, we, we acknowledge that this is a profound technology. Um, but the magic, again, 
the, the beauty actually emerges when you combine these technologies and explore the interstitial spaces between them. And so we get really excited about teams that are, are flexible in their thinking and take combinatorial approaches. And then ultimately, Andrew and I are really excited about companies that are interested in making medicines. And so that typically means companies that are fusing the dry lab with the wet lab, interested in vertical integration. Um, you know, it's not monolithically true, but that's typically the characteristic of a company that we'd, we'd want to work with. And then, you know, depending on their stage, sometimes they have, you know, targets, they have clinical indications they're exploring, and we'll obviously spend time with the team and KOLs in our network to help us really uncover um, whether the science is, is differentiated. Um, so, so I think that's the, the broader framework, although we obviously tailor it to the company as we're spending time with them. Yeah, and there's, there's a couple of things I would just highlight there. And, you know, Morgan, I think you did a good job emphasizing the importance of the team. And, you know, that goes without saying. But one thing we've just seen evolve in the tech biospace, especially over the last five years, is the profile of the teams or the uh, the makeup of those teams. And, you know, for five or six years ago, even a decade ago, especially, a lot of the teams were either biotech teams that said they were going to use some computation or they were tech teams that knew nothing about healthcare and biotech, but said, you know, they're going to use AI and it's going to fix everything. Um, I think over the last few years, we've really seen this shift where we're now uh, seeing what we call bilingual teams or teams that have expertise across both dimensions, both domains, not necessarily in the same individual, but they're able to collaborate as a team and really bridge that gap of being best, best of breed uh, solutions on the computation side, but with also the expertise and knowledge of how do you select a target? What are the right experiments to run? You know, what are the no go to go no go decisions that are going to be really important to you? Um, how are we going to optimally set up the clinical trials and the chemistry optimization of the um, antibody optimization that you need to do, and actually take that forward and turn it into a drug? And that evolution has been a really important one for this space that I can't under emphasize that's that's made us really excited to be investing in this space. And the last thing I'd just say is, you know, Morgan alludes to the fact that we can be um, reactive a little bit in terms of seeing a new opportunity that might be adjacent to one of the current roadmaps. A lot of our roadmaps come from seeing entrepreneurs who are identifying really interesting opportunities and, you know, we'll build that roadmap alongside that diligence process if, if that is something we get really intrigued by and, you know, build that um, um, expertise and that conviction over the course of the diligence uh, as we invest. Oh, I love that flexibility. And I'm going to come back to the team in a moment. But before I do, and again, this question for you both would love your thoughts. Do you have recommendations for founders who are reaching out to Bessemer? How can they best connect and put their best foot forward when, when they do connect with you? Uh, email us or LinkedIn message us. Uh, we're, we're pretty open to any introduction and, you know, happy to share information in the podcast if it's, if it's live, but I think it's just Andrew at BVP and Morgan at BVP.com. Uh, so please, please reach out. All right. Well, you know, I think the, the other thing I will mention, Chris, is what is helpful is um, a warm introduction is always helpful if you have a connection to us and um, that, that is helpful. But even if you don't have a warm connection, please just reach out. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look. Um, but highlight what has changed in the world to our roadmap um, philosophy. Why is now a really interesting time to be building what you're building? And why are you the best team suited to, to uh, build against that? And so if you can emphasize that, that is super helpful up front. Oh, perfect. Well, pivoting slightly then and talking now about portfolio support and the companies that you are working with, what does being a good portfolio partner mean to you? So for me, it means being a first call relationship and building the trust uh, to, to really be a thought partner for our colleagues and, and the CEOs, founders, executive teams that we work with. And yeah, I want to understand what's going well. I want to understand what's going poorly and how can we help support you. And so, you know, we, we want to be there in the good times and the bad. I think, um, you know, it's, it's easy to be there in the good times, but in the bad times, we want to make sure that we're, you know, bringing the resources that we have to bear, you know, personally, but also across the firm to make sure that we're supporting those companies, thinking through strategic issues, team issues, whatever it might be, uh, financing issues. And, you know, that, um, I think that's the most important thing to us is just being a good partner and a good thought partner uh, overall. Yeah, I might add for me, I think a lot about it and just in terms of consistency, like in any relationship, consistency is key. And so uh, to Andrew's point, whether it's a challenging time for the company, whether things are going really well, just always, always being frankly available, you know, founders, you know, text, FaceTime, smoke signal, like I'm picking up, Andrew's picking up, like we're, we're you know, we, we want to be there um, for, for all of the moments. And 
Um, I also think self-honesty. So if, if we think about like our relative strength as investors, like what are we kind of uniquely suited to contribute to the company? And, and what is the con company uniquely need from us? Aligning on that, and, and it'll evolve over time as the company matures and grows, but aligning on that's super important because we don't want to feign that we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then actually it turns out we were better suited to do, you know, ABC. I mean, if, if we're really good at one thing, the company can surround itself with other people who might be good at another and making sure there's kind of a constellation of advisors and investors um, that are best suited to tackle all the various um, kind of things the company is going to need over time, I think is key. So building that self-honest relationship is also something that I really look forward to uh, when working with our companies. Yeah. And there, there's one other thing I'd mention. Um, on the healthcare team, we sort of joke that uh, we practice the Hippocratic Oath of Healthcare VC, uh, of venture capital. And so that means first do no harm. And, uh, and, and we take that seriously. We, we understand our role as a venture capitalist. I think that comes with being a firm that has a storied history and has uh, had a lot of experience of what does a good venture capitalist look like and how can we best support you at the board level? And that doesn't mean running the company in our point of, in our view, it's how do we support you in building that company and making sure the company has the right resources, but uh, don't get too involved to the point that we're being destructive. And I think we, we understand that role and make sure that we, we take that seriously. That's a seriousness I'm sure all of your portfolio companies support. And I really like that phrase you used, Andrew, about being the first point of call. Uh, it's something I might uh, borrow in the future. But bringing it back to the team and providing that support and thinking about the lengthy life cycle of companies and the fact that uh, building teams, especially teams and relationships that last for 10 or more years, um, company culture uh, can be obviously critical especially in tech bio, where you're seeing that mix of tech and bio. So as an investor from at times the earliest stages through growth, how do you think about supporting these interdisciplinary teams and helping founders build a long lasting uh, but flexible company culture? Yeah, this goes back to the point on self-honesty. So when we partner with, with founders, usually we're asking ourselves like a, a series of questions, but it's helpful just to characterize the, the founders relative kind of zones of genius and, and the areas where, frankly, either they're, they're not as adept or it's not an area or skill they want to develop and making sure that whatever that is for that founder, that we surround them with other members on the team if they haven't hired them yet, who can really complement those skill sets. I think that is really important in terms of culture building because ultimately companies are not science projects and they're also not business development engines in, in biotech and tech bio. Like they're this kind of amalgamation of the two and like the, the, the company is going to need to build out both capabilities to be successful. And so just making sure that everyone's self-honest about what they're contributing and what that's going to look like over time. Like that's something that we, we think about um, higher level than that. You know, when we invest in companies, we, we always ask what their, their mission, vision, and values are. Um, and, and we take it seriously. I mean, without that North star for an organization, it's really hard for the people who work there or who are considering working there to get excited. And we see the companies that have very clear kind of, line of thought on some of those um, tenants doing a lot better in recruiting top talent if they're you know clearly articulating what it is that they're doing um, and and you know every board meeting usually starts with here's our mission here's our vision here's our values and here are all the things we just did over the last three months that contribute to these you know these milestones in some some type of way so I think that's how we think about it um, it's super important and if we actually we I don't know Andrew what your take would be on this but if I think about you know, the percentage of time that we're actually having board level conversations about company culture. I mean, it is a top board level topic. And so it just, it couldn't be something like it's, it's so important to us. And, and we definitely lean in and make sure that our companies feel supported in, in building great enduring cultures. I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, one, one other thing I sometimes try to do is um, when we first invest in a company, ask a company to set out their five-year vision, um, which sounds really simple in nature, uh, but you know, actually being specific of what do we want the company to look like from a mission standpoint, from, you know, how far they've taken a clinical program um, through development. What does the team look like? How big is the team? What are the funding milestones? What other metrics are important to them within five years? And then actually work backwards to say, well, that means in year four, you need to have achieved this to realistically achieve what you want to in year five. And then if you want to get there by year four, you need to achieve this by year three and work backwards to year two. And then in the next year, these are the activities that you need to, to really focus on. And for these interdisciplinary teams, I think you really need to make sure that that five-year vision 
includes you know attributes that are really important to both pieces of the team and they're aligned together and there's you know a way that they both see how their roles are very important to that five-year vision on a step-by-step -step basis throughout those years and ensuring that there's alignment against that will help everyone move in the same direction. Andrew's comment just reminded me too of something we talk a lot about internally with the multilingual team which is like it can be challenging for engineers to have empathy for what a wet lab scientist is doing and, and vice versa. And so we love when we hear that teams are kind of breaking down those institutional silos and actually working together. Like we appreciate that remote work is, is here to stay. And look, Andrew and I are calling in from two different zip codes. But, um, you know, when companies can actually have computer scientists like working down the hall or even I've heard some companies even have like a single pane of glass right between the wet lab and the dry lab, like that's something that can really help, um, uh, you know, foster a, a culture of collaboration and really give both sides empathy for what the other is doing. Like one side might be generating data and one side might be working with the data. Well, the side that's working with the data, if you're going to complain about how it's generated, like go try to do it yourself right? and see see what that's like. And so we think that like empathy building you know, across these different disciplines is is also like a great a great uh, exercise for our companies. Something I heard of in the past ooh, that one company had done was actually they took uh, the leaders of different teams coming from these different backgrounds and they had them shadow another for a week just to see what it was like and to understand all of the challenges that go into um, leading a wet lab or a dry lab team or maybe even a hardware team and then linking that back to their own discipline. And you're right, I think it's a sort of cross-pollination is incredibly important. And it goes back to what you were saying up front, Morgan, around how are you honest about your own capabilities and then understand what do the others bring to the table? Because only by bringing those skill sets together can we really, as it, or Andrew was pointing out, lay out that five-year vision and then work backwards by understanding the interconnected requirements to get there. And so- uh, I love that idea. That's a great idea. Yeah, I hope it's uh, taken and borrowed. It wasn't, it wasn't originally mine, but it, it's something that as soon as I heard, I thought made a lot of sense. Uh, and a, another um, a very, very different style was uh, just about adding a little bit of fun to the company where they went out and they did taste tests for ice cream just to see <laughs> which was going to be the best ice cream place in the locale, which is a personal lover of the, of the dessert is something I would also enjoy, so. I think you can right. take it in different uh, different directions and occasionally stepping back from the professional is always, uh, it can be nice, uh, it can be a nice addition. But pivoting back to the conversation at hand um, and even building on your point, Andrew, about that sort of five-year vision and what you were saying earlier, Morgan, about five years ago, seeing this sort of rise of tech bio and building a roadmap around it. It seems like uh, from the beginning, as investors, you've had a very future forward and tech enabled uh, investment perspective. We'd love to learn what you've been seeing from founders in terms of the next cycle of emerging technologies and just to get a sense of what are you most excited by? Andrew, do you want to start? Sure. sure. Uh, I'll throw in a few different things that we're, we're spending time on and, and seeing. Um, so I mentioned that we spent a bunch of time in structural biology and computational physics, which led us to our investment in Peptone. And I think we're still seeing a lot of opportunity there. And I think what, what got us really excited about that company in particular is upwards of 50% of proteins are known as intrinsically disordered proteins. And uh, these are proteins that are malleable. They're not well suited to um, traditional structural biology tools like um, x-ray crystallography. And they're also not well suited for alpha 2 or other, other um, AI generated uh, structure predictions. And so this company has figured out a physics-based way to understand that underlying structure of those malleable uh, disordered proteins and then how to best drug them. And I think the idea of using computation to unlock novel biology or unlo unlock um, traditionally undruggable targets, as as Morgan had said, is, is something that continues to intrigue us and is an area that we continue to be excited about and we'll be looking for. You know, beyond that, we, we had made an investment in a company called Chimera Therapeutics, which is, which is a targeted protein degradation company. And we're seeing the next uh, wave of companies in that space. We, we love that company. We think there's a lot of potential there. And we also think there's a lot of potential in, in adjacent areas like molecular glues. Um, and so that's been an area that we've been spending a good amount of time. We've been looking at radio pharmaceuticals, uh, next generation gene editing technologies, single cell and spatial biology, uh, delivery tech for for cell and gene therapy. And so there's a lot of a lot of activity in this space and a lot of things to be excited about going forward. Morgan, was there anything specific you might want to add as well? 
I, I think uh, I think Andrew covered the bulk of our roadmaps. We also like roadmaps have different levels of maturity. And so we also have some more like moonshot kind of roadmaps where we're like, this is going to be important. We just have no idea like within what time frame that'll be the case. And so, um, you know, a couple a couple areas there looking at, you know, different uh, organoid models and, and cell free assays, obviously, like as Andrew mentioned earlier, regulatory catalysts can be immense boons for different areas we're investing and appreciating that the FDA has put out you know, strong support for exploring alternative uh, models to the traditional animal model. We're really excited about organ on chip, cell-free assets, as I mentioned, and companies that are uh, thinking about uh, creative opportunities there. Um, and then the other one that seems just to be looming and is particularly relevant in a post-pandemic era is this notion of, of biosecurity or biodefense. Um, you know, if we if we think about all the great technologies that that uh, you talk about on this podcast, you know, we're assuming like great actors are using these to find new drugs, and that's certainly what's what's happening across the world. But we'd be remiss on to acknowledge that these same technologies are available on Hugging Face, on you know, name your your open source package manager to people who potentially have different intentions. And you know, I think there was a Nature paper that came out that showed that um, in a matter of six hours, researchers were able to repurpose drug discovery technology to generate tens of thousands of potentially lethal molecules, right? And so I think right now, Andrew and I are trying to figure out with the rest of our team, like, what is a biosecurity company? How do we, like, what does this look like? Is it is it going to start top down where there's going to be regulatory bodies that are coming up with different, you know, libraries that you should screen against before you're, you're, you're ordering nucleic acids or, or something like that? Or is it going to be more of a consortium model. We think there's going to be really important both software as well as molecular technology that's going to address this area over the next five to ten years. I mean, we'd be we'd be uh, we'd be remiss not to be talking about it. So that's an area that we're kind of learning more about and developing a roadmap around today. You know, it's and it's one that I know has been top of mind uh, for different aspects of the government for quite a while. I remember over a decade past going to iGEM competitions and having the FBI come through and do a session on biosecurity. So it's clear that there's been um, thought around this and I'm similarly curious to understand what comes next. And as we talk about today, uh, we're seeing as much, it seems like innovation on the business side as the science side of the life sciences. And so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on go-to-market strategy, company journey, for the uh, next wave of tech bio startups and biotech companies. How do you think about um, giving advice to your portfolio companies as they grow and move forward? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of different things that are relevant here. Um, if we're talking about tech bio specifically, I think as Morgan mentioned earlier, we, we tend to be focused on companies that are developing medicines themselves. Um, we sort of jokingly called uh, these companies tech bio mullets in the sense that in the front, they look like a uh, biotech company or a traditional biotech company, but in the back, they're leveraging computation. Um, it's a crude analogy, but it works for us. Um, and so looking for these tech bio mullets that are really focused on delivering uh, therapeutics to add value to patients' lives and uh, treat patients safely and effectively. And I think at the end of the day, it almost doesn't matter if you're using computation to develop a drug. What matters is, is the drug safe and effective and adding value to patients and providers uh, um, over time. And so that that's sort of a North Star for us in a lot of the companies that we're looking at. Whether you fully finance that through, you know, you know, phase three trials is a financing discussion over time. Do you uh, partner part of the platform? Do you partner a specific asset? That's another discussion. I think it's very situationally dependent, but that's more of a financing structure. How do you optimize the, the cap table? How do you think through you know, what is the best non-dilutive source of capital over time? And you know, what are the best value inflection points and use of proceeds of, of the capital that you can obtain through through venture capital resources? And so those are all discussions that are had in real time. They're very company dependent, very situationally dependent about upon which assets do you have the most conviction in? What do you have conviction in in terms of what the platform capabilities are? Where might you be able to partner and build additional expertise and additional um Getting additional funding, and so those, those are very relevant questions. Um, you know, I think we're we're also looking at companies that don't necessarily develop uh, therapeutics or medicines, and you know, for those, I think you just have to have a really clear value proposition and understand who your buyer is. And it looks like any other business in terms of how do you build your your go to market strategy and have the right sales team in place, and you know, understand are you selling to large pharma, are you selling to early stage biotech companies, and what does the go to market look like across those various stakeholders. Well said. 
what's coming next for Bessemer? Uh, well, we recently announced our latest fund in August. Uh, so to shy of $4 billion, we've got money to put to work. And so that's what we're focused on right now is figuring uh, out where, where should we be investing and uh, what are the best companies and teams to back in that space. And so that, that's where we're spending a lot of time. All right. Well, before we come to a close, a few rapid fire questions for both of you, just to cap things off. Uh, first and foremost, do you have any advice for those earlier in their careers that are seeking to pursue uh, venture? Andrew, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, you know, when I was first interviewing at Bessemer, one of my colleagues, uh, Jeremy Levine, gave me a framework for how to think about uh, being a venture capitalist. And I think every VC does this in some shape or form, but you need to figure out where your strengths are across these different attributes. And there's five things that need to happen to make a venture capital investment. First, you need to have an investment thesis. Second, you need to figure out um, how you're going to source deals, find deals proactively or reactively through your network. How do you diligence those effectively and make sure you're making sound uh, decisions, understanding the risks? Um, the known unknowns are also important to understand and really making sure that you, you have the you know, right level of information to make an informed decision. Learning how to win a deal and make sure that you are supportive to the companies over time and you know, build build that expertise is also important. And then finally, fifth is how do you best support those companies through their journey, um, either to M&A or IPO or some other outcome? And all of, all of those things are important, but I think the core skill set to build early on is creating investment theses and then figuring out how to source uh, opportunities. And so I strongly recommend you test out your own investment theses, actually put it down on paper, build PowerPoint decks to you know, pressure test the thesis, figure out why now is interesting in the space. How would you evaluate those companies? And then actually figure out how would you find companies that fit those investment theses and put that down on paper. And you can track that over time to see how those companies do. And if, if you start building that uh, skill set, I think that gives you a sense of, do you like the job, number one, which is really important. And then two, how do you refine your, your investment strategy over time and think through making sure that you're able to deliver on all, all five of those attributes over time? Great advice. Morgan? Yeah, I completely agree with everything Andrew shared. I would say also at the early stages in a, in a VC career, it's really important to just consume as much information as you can. Like, you know, as an, as an investor, we're not particularly deep in any one area. Again, like we're not experts in a single modality or a single uh, target, but we're, we're asked to play across a very broad landscape. And so I, I find the information diet to be an essential uh, element of, of being a good investor and just to try to you know, for the Bayesians who listen to the podcast, like train your priors is kind of like the, you know, the example I'd give. Um, and that could be, you know, from within bio, but also from, from outside of bio. So like I was talking to a friend last week who works at a methods development group at a large tech company and he works in bio, but I was asking him like, you know, you all are building new methods. Like, where do you find the inspiration for new methods? And he was like, you know, actually we read a lot of machine learning papers from other fields, like not even related to bio. And I think that analogy extends really well to venture where you know, we're at a generalist fund. We can sit here and see what's happening on our consumer team and see that they're talking about generative AI for synthetic voice or synthetic avatars. And we can say, well, it's only a matter of time. It's it's a matter of like when, not if, this technology makes its way into bio. And then you can start to, to Andrew's point, really refine that thesis into something that's coherent, that can be articulated, that can be shared, that can be, um, uh, you know, distilled uh, for others to understand it and, and poke, poke holes in it, frankly. It's also an important part of this process is it's really, it's really iterative. Um, so I, I'd say information diet and, and consuming content um, to, to shape your theses is, is essential. I mean, we've talked a lot about the professional today and thank you so much for giving our audience some advice as well as some insight. How do you like to spend your free time? Maybe let's dive a little bit into the personal just for a moment. Morgan, do you want to start first this time? Yeah, I'll go briefly. I have a, you can't see it here. I have a massive indoor plant collection. Um, so I'm often tending to my plants or uh, finding new ones to bring home. So that's a, a huge hobby of mine. And then for the folks who know me, um, I spend a lot of time in Brooklyn. That's my community. And there's lots of fun, like concerts, shows, art things that I frequent. So um, just being there is kind of a happy place for me and exploring all the different things that are going on. Andrew? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got two kids who are both under the age of three, uh, and so I spend a lot of time with them, and I, I love it. They're, they're at really fun ages, but they they consume a lot of my time uh, alongside my wife, and so uh, we try to do as many outdoor activities as possible with them, uh, going skiing now, and um, you know just being outside in general with them. 
And it's a lot of fun. Uh, two pandemic babies uh, are not something I necessarily recommend, but they've uh, they've been awesome to uh, you know have in our lives. So we're 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 spending a ton of time with them now. Um, beyond that, I'm a massive Buffalo Bills fan. It's something that you would see if you looked in my office. There's a lot of Bills paraphernalia here, and so I I, I am very optimistic for next season now. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. And Morgan, next time I'm in Brooklyn, I'll definitely hit you up. Uh, otherwise, any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs, anything we've missed you'd love to share? Just reach out. If you got something that right uh, you know is, is interesting that we should be taking a look at, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew and Morgan, for an absolutely fantastic conversation, a great episode. Very, very thankful for your time. And thank you again. Thanks, Chris.